Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Welcome back to the program again this week, and thank you for joining us every week at the same time. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to tune in and, uh, and to watch us share the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, we deeply appreciate you as our viewers, and, and we uh, just say that if you have missed any of the programs and you would like to go back, and because we, 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 as we teach, a lot of times we're teaching things that we're building on in uh, prior programs, but you can go back at any time to our YouTube page, and you can watch us online on demand on your computer, your smart device, uh, your smart TV, uh, your iPad. You can watch us. Everything we have aired to date is archived there, and it is available to you to watch at your leisure. Uh, you can simply, probably an easy way to do it is just simply go to my website, and there is a link there from our website directly to our YouTube page. There's also a link there to our iTunes, uh, our podcast. There's a link there also for an RSS feed that will go straight to your Android device. So you can watch us and follow along even when you don't have time to sit down and watch the television program. And so I trust you're being blessed by continuing to watch with us. Uh, we've been sharing some things out of the book of Matthew, and I'm going to follow up today uh, by beginning in the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. Now, over the last, uh, I think, seven weeks, we dealt with Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 4. My son was on the TV program with me last week. I did one by myself today. Uh, of course, we are here on set by myself teaching. And I want to talk about the Beatitudes. And you say, well, what are the Beatitudes, Dr. House? Well, let me simply put it this. They are attitudes that you need to be in. A Beatitude is an attitude you need to be in. And one of the things that we shared with you in prior segments is the message that John the Baptist preached. The message that Jesus preached was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the whole message was around repentance, which does not just mean that uh, you, you need to get saved, and that's all part of repentance, but it's a word that means to change the way you think. Now these Beatitudes are what's going to change some of what you're thinking. They are attitudes that you need to shift your thinking in. Because if what he's saying is repent, the kingdom is at hand, these attitudes or these teachings that Jesus are teaching in the Beatitudes are attitudes that will help you learn how, first of all, to receive the kingdom. Second part of the Beatitudes are attitudes that will teach you how to release and distribute and manifest the kingdom. And once again, when I'm talking about the kingdom, uh, there's so little known about the gospel of the kingdom. And one of the things we're going to get to here before too awful long on the program is we're going to start uh, talking about the Beatitudes. Or not Beatitudes, I'm sorry, we're going to start talking about some of the parables of the kingdom. Because many times when you hear people say they want to talk about the gospel of the kingdom or the kingdom of heaven, uh, we think we're talking, or many people think, well, he's talking about when we go to heaven. No, when Jesus preached the kingdom, he interchanged the terms, the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, depending on whether you're reading them in Matthew or you're reading them in Luke or you're reading them in Mark. It interchanges the term kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Now, while I do definitely, without reservation, believe there is a heaven, uh, and that certainly, you know, if you're absent from the body, you are going to go there. That is a given to every believer. What I'm simply seeing here is that Jesus and John the Baptist were introducing uh, the kingdom of God as being uh, the government of God extended not only in heaven, but what's happening in heaven being extended to the earth. I, I believe in Genesis' misty garden uh, of, of the Garden of Eden, heaven and earth were so intertwined and interfaced that you cannot tell as Adam is walking with God in the cool of the day, uh, he knows angels by their name, yet he's naming animals. There is such a, uh, a, such a connection and an interface between heaven and earth that when you read the book of Genesis, you cannot get, and when you read the book of Genesis, you cannot tell if this man is in a garden 
or is the garden in this man? I think that's pretty profound. But the reality of it is, it's both. He was in a garden, but the garden was also in him. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, we talked about this before from the fourth chapter of Matthew, uh, Jesus shows up where Adam left off. Adam had a garden and it became a waste howling wilderness. Jesus shows up in a waste howling wilderness and begins to bring restoration of the kingdom as he begins to heal the sick, as he begins to cleanse the leper, as he begins to cast out devils. And he declares to them, if I by the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Anything that eases the suffering of the human condition is what the, is the kingdom of God invading our earth. Hallelujah. And if anything we need to learn how to pray, thy kingdom come, your will be done, not just in heaven, but in earth, even as it is in the heavens. And so I want to get into the Beatitudes here today and talk about several things. But he said, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, now, uh, he, he went up into this mountain, and he's beginning to teach this stuff to, uh, at least, it looks like to me, mainly his disciples. And he began to teach them, and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying is the first attitude that needs to be addressed is you're blessed when you're poor in spirit. Now, that does not mean to me that we go around with our head hanging down and saying, oh, woe is me, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing, I'm doomed, I'm done. No, what that simply said is when you recognize, especially remembering that the audience he's teaching is an old covenant audience that he is trying to bring into an understanding of the new covenant and the new kingdom and the new day that's about to dawn, and he's saying to them, if you're under, let me just say it like this again, because we need to understand the setting of this. Actually, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, although they are in uh, the New Testament, they are still in the Old Covenant because uh, the death of Jesus has not yet inaugurated and the blood has not been shed to inaugurate uh, the, the fullness of this New Covenant. But Jesus is introducing it and he's telling them, this is what you need to change your mind about if you're going to receive the kingdom. These are the attitudes that you're going to have to get. And he's saying, if you can hear it like this, he's saying like this, if you're sitting under an Old Covenant paradigm, you better begin to understand what a spiritual deficit you're in. Because one of the things that they were depleted of under the old covenant was the indwelling government of the Holy Spirit. So when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, he's saying to them, if you come to the re realization of the spiritual deficit that you're in under this old covenant, because what you had under the old covenant was you had a lot of rules, but you didn't have an indwelling Holy Spirit that John was preaching, was coming, and Jesus was preaching, was coming, because John the Baptist, two chapters before this, says, uh, you know, uh, he says to them, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will pur thoroughly purge his four. So he's saying to them, listen, the one that's coming after me is going to give you the supply of the Spirit. Uh, he's going to give you uh, not just more demands or rules on rocks. He's going to give you the promise. What was the promise? One of the promises is Acts chapter 2, go to an upper room and wait for the promise of the Spirit. So under an old covenant, you were deplete. You were empty. And one of the things he tells even one of the churches in the book of Revelation, he says, because you think you're rich and increased in goods, and don't know, need anything, but you wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee by me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. Now, I don't think he's saying here that it is wrong uh, to have money or to have riches. What I think he's saying here is that if you don't understand the deficit you're in under an old covenant paradigm, and you think you're rich and increased in goods, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. That's not how much money you have. That's when you have dependence on your own abilities to try to walk in the kingdom. In other words, listen, the whole, whole point, uh, 
or one of the points that's being made from the old covenant is there's none righteous, not even nobody made it in the old covenant based on their performance. Because outside of the Holy Spirit being given, uh, there's no there's no indwelling there's no indwelling power. In other words, let me say it like this: the old covenant is full of demands that a bankrupt humanity has never been able to perform. But the new covenant is full of divine supply. My God will supply all your need. And that's more than your grocery bill or your electric bill. He supplies our need for the spirit. One of the things that I've said, and I I reiterate this over and over and over again, but I think it's so powerful. It's worth repeating over and over again. When the children of Israel came up out of Egypt and they're delivered from the bondage of Egyptian slavery, they're delivered by the blood of a spotless lamb. They put a lamb on the doorpost of their house and they take the lamb inside the house and eat the lamb in the night roast with fire. Now that to me, first of all, is a powerful picture of Jesus Christ who is the true lamb of God and that we must apply his blood. Uh, and then not only do we apply the blood because the blood said to the death angel, not that this house has escaped. The blood said to the death angel, there has already been a death exacted here. The death of the lamb was the death of the firstborn in the land of Goshen. Jesus was, uh, his death was not substitutionary in the sense that he died so you don't have to. He died because you had to. Somebody said, well, he died to give you life. No, he died to give you a death. Because you needed a death to who you were in Adam. He got back up from the dead to give you a life. And so the reality of it is, is that when we take the blood, and yes, you must apply it. There's, a, there, there, there's so much crazy stuff going on out there now being taught that, uh, I mean, I, I've heard people even tell you, you don't need to believe, you don't uh, need to receive Jesus. And I never was a sinner. To me, I, listen, I, to me, the patterns are so powerfully here that, y- y- you know, they, they took the blood of the lamb, they took it out, they plied it to the doorpost, they ate on the lamb, and to the houses who did not apply the blood of the lamb, guess what? There was a difference between those houses. God made a difference, and there was a difference made between them because there's blood-curling screams coming from the lips of Egyptian mothers as they would lean over the lifeless bodies of their firstborn. But when he talked, when the death angel turned to walk down Main Street Goshen, somebody had applied the blood of the lamb to their house. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost when I talk like that. Because the writer of the book of Hebrews grabs this concept and he said, there's a blood that speaks. I I tell you, I believe for those of us who are believers, who have applied the blood of the lamb to the doorpost of our house, I believe it draws a line in the sand and God said, I'm going to make a difference between the land of Goshen and the land of Egypt. And I believe that difference is there was blood on the doorpost of the house and that blood will do the talking for us. The blood speaks. I believe there are people watching me today and you got things going on in your families. You got children that are uh, being absolutely ravaged by substance abuse and by, uh, you know, violence and things going on in the world. There's all kind of stuff going on in the world. And if you wanted to, you could get real nervous and get real scared. But here's what I say to you. Let the blood do the talking. Let the blood do the talking at your house and say, this blood is going to speak for me. You know, one of the things I've been declaring over my own home is where he brought him up out of Egypt. He said, none of these diseases will come upon you. I'm going to bless your bread. I'm going to bless your water. And I'm going to remove sickness from among you. If that could happen under an old covenant paradigm, how much more should we have this under a new covenant paradigm for those of us who have not sacrificed a physical barnyard animal, but for those of us who have applied the blood of Jesus to the doorpost of our houses and have said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And not only put the blood on the doorpost, but take the lamb in the house and eat the lamb in the night roast with fire because the more lamb you get in your belly, I've said it like this, eat mo lamb, hallelujah, nothing but mutton. I mean, when you start consuming the lamb and you start feeding on lamb, something happened to them at midnight where they got up and says, I cannot live in this bondage any longer. Here's what I think happens. You get enough lamb in your belly 
and you won't be able to live in bondage any longer. You won't be able to live in the bondage of religion. You won't be able to live in the bondage of substance abuse. You won't be able to live in the bondage of whatever it is you're a servant or a slave to. Something rises up in you and says, I was born to be free. And you will get up and that will empower you. Now, what I'm after is they left Egypt delivered by the blood of the Lamb and by the Lamb that was inside their house. They come to the bank of the Red Sea, and as they cross the Red Sea, they're delivered not this time, uh, they're delivered by the water. So they have been delivered by the blood in Egypt. At the Red Sea, they're baptized into the sea, and the writer of the New Testament says they were baptized into Moses, who was the mediator of that covenant. In the New Covenant, you and I are baptized into Christ. That's how we get in Christ. Galatians says, for as many as you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. I don't think we're arbitrarily in Christ. Uh, I, I think we're in Christ like uh, Levi was in the loins of Abraham, but not every man has been born out of the loins of Christ yet. Every man it has to come in his own order. But I believe we are uh, experientially in Christ when we are born again, when we are baptized into Christ, we have put on Christ. And uh, then he goes in there and says in Galatians, as many of you were baptized into Christ to put on Christ. And then he goes on to say, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And so what I want you to see is, first of all, they're delivered by blood in Egypt. They're delivered by water at the Red Sea. But 50 days exactly after they cross out of the uh, land of Egypt, they are in the wilderness, and exactly 50 days later, God comes down on Mount Sinai, a cloud comes down on the mountain, and when that cloud comes down on the mountain, God gives the people the law written on stone. The moment God gives the people the law written on stone, 3,000 people drop dead. Now, I want to fast forward to the New Testament and tell you that Jesus was our Passover lamb. And exactly 50 days after he is crucified, they are in an upper room. And this time another cloud comes down on the mountain, but God doesn't give them rules on rocks this time. He gives them exactly 50 days after Jesus is crucified, after the lamb is slain, same exact amount of time is 50 days. That's why he says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, because the word Pentecost literally means 50. So 50 days after Jesus has been crucified, they are in an upper room. And this time he does not give them rules on rocks. He gives them the Holy Spirit. And when he gives them the Holy Spirit, exactly 3,000 people are added to the church. Why is that? Because under the old covenant, the letter kills. 3,000 drop dead. In the new covenant... The Spirit gives life. 3,000 are added to the church. So that if you don't get anything else that I say on this program, this is probably one of the most important things I'm going to say to you. So that the Holy Spirit is to the new covenant what the law was to the old covenant. And if the Holy Spirit can't make you behave, then all the church sheriffs you got are not going to make people behave. See, but those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. In other words, there's another form of government. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. What is that? The kingdom of God is another form of government that's come on the scene. This time it's not a government of rules. This time it's a government that flows from a relationship with the Spirit. That's why he's saying you're blessed if you're poor in spirit. In other words, if you don't realize under this old covenant, you are bankrupt. If you think your riches increased in goods and don't need nothing, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy me gold tried in the fire that you can be rich and white raiment. The shame of your nakedness does not appear. And to anoint your eyes with eyes, Sam, that you might see. He, 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 uh, what he's simply getting them to see is, man, recognize your need. If you're still standing under an old covenant paradigm, now in the new covenant, God gives the Holy Spirit. In one place he says, if a son shall ask for bread, would you give him a stone? I think that's, that, there's a lot, I, I probably need to not chase rabbits here on that one, but I think it could be talking about, again, uh, the stone of the law. Would you give him commandments? Would you give him rules on rocks? No, you'd give him the bread of heaven. And then he goes on to say, uh, 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 if he asked for bread, would you give him a stone? If he asked for fish, would you give him a serpent? If he asked for an egg, would you give him a serpent? And then he says, sh sh will not your father give 
To everyone who, uh, that asks for the Holy Spirit, will he not give them the Holy Spirit? In other words, the whole point that he's saying there is all the things that you were asking for prior to that was, 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 was stuff that I believe somewhat points to the law. I don't have time to develop all of that except to say this to you. The, he, the key p point that he's saying is, is that those that ask for the Holy Spirit, he's going to give them the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the kingdom. It's a new form of government. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, it's peace, it's joy, and it's located in the Holy Ghost. And so what he's saying to them here is if you are blessed when you're poor in spirit, and when you realize that under this old covenant paradigm, it's a bankrupt system that has no empowerment, no indwelling Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus would say in Matthew 11, of those born of women, there's none greater than John the Baptist. Yet I say to you, he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Why is that? Because you and I have access to the indwelling Holy Spirit. In John 14, Jesus said to them, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And in that same chapter, he says, I'm going to send you another. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And when he comes... He's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. And so I believe the very first attitude that needs to be shifted is that if you're thinking in terms of an old covenant, then you need to shift that paradigm from a, uh, a paradigm that says, I am bankrupt because you were under an old covenant. But now there's divine supply. Now the Holy Spirit is given uh, to anyone who asks. Let me just grab this very quickly, if I, if I can do it quickly. I'm going to go to Romans, the eighth chapter, and I'm going to read this to you from the Message Bible because it really, uh, to me, kind of delivers a little bit clearer what I'm trying to say. It says, with the arrival of Jesus, this is the Message Bible, Romans 8, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded life of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the juggler when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem of something remote and unimportant in his son Jesus he took, personally took on the human condition, entered this disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was, by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of the deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling, watch this, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. I like that. Instead of redoubling your own efforts, living in a bankrupt covenant that couldn't produce anything. This whole Romans 8 is dealing with moving from the dilemma of this, when I want to do good, evil is present with me. What I want to do is not what I do, but what I hate, that's what I end up doing. And I used to think as I read that, chapter 7, that's chapter 7, the last few verses, that that's the, that, that, that's the plight of the human, or the Christian walk. No, no, that's not the plight of the Christian walk, is, is an up and down roller coaster ride. That's the plight of somebody who's under law. They're in, they're out. They're up, they're down. It's a roller coaster ride. If I want to do good, evil's present with me. Paul finally ended that chapter by saying, Oh, wretched, pitiful man that I am. Who, who, that's the key word, shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, I thank God he will. And then he swings over into Romans 8 and says, There's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying, Since you're not up, up under law, there cannot be any condemnation because that's a legal term. You cannot be indicted and convicted on a law that is no longer in effect. And we're going to get into this as we get on down into chapter 5 here of Matthew because he said, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle of the law will pass until all be fulfilled. I want to show you that heaven and earth, the way the Jews would have seen it, did pass away. And with it went an old, because that old heaven and that old earth was connected to their temple, it was connected to their covenant. It was connected to their land. And what was happening was an old 
if just for uh, making it as simple as I know how to, when, when, when uh, I believe it was Jacob wrestled, he said, this is Bethel. This is the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So to the Jewish mindset, the temple was the place where heaven and earth met, but with the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70 was a removing of that final old covenant system so that we are not up under that any longer. A new covenant has now come on the scene where there's therefore now no condemnation. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit doesn't deal with you to change you. It simply means you cannot be indicted and convicted under an antiquated law of a mosaic system. But it does not leave you lawless, because what happens is, in the new covenant, there's a new law. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. And so what he's saying is, instead of putting these laws on people, because all they are is a band-aid on sin. I believe if you could see the American church, we look like a bunch of people that would be a great commercial for a band-aid commercial. Because we got band-aids stuck all over people and we think we are dealing with the sin issue and all we're doing is we are putting a band-aid on sin. I'm telling you, instead of that redoubling your own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit of God is doing in you. And in other words, instead of making New Year's resolutions, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to redouble my efforts, we simply come into a place where we embrace what the Spirit of God is doing in us because we are no longer poor in spirit. We have moved. That attitude is what made me receive the kingdom. And when I received the kingdom, now I've been empowered to walk in the kingdom and to walk in the spirit where I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, we're just about to run out of time. And I trust you're being enjoyed this. All we've done is we've dealt with one of these beatitudes. We're going to try to cover more of them in the next step. But uh, if you're enjoying our program, please take a moment to Call that number on the screen and uh, help us if you can uh, to sow a seed into the ministry that helps us take the gospel of the kingdom around the world. If you're being blessed by what we're doing, I believe it's worth sowing into. You can do it several ways. You can go to our website and you can give via credit card there. You can call the number on the screen. Somebody will be standing by to take your uh, credit card or your debit card. Or you can simply write a check and send it to the address that will be on the screen in just a moment. You also may want to consider signing up for our message of the month club. It's a message we send out every month from somewhere we've been with a message like this on it. If you'd like to become part of that, go to our website. There's a link there where you can sign up. It's $7 a month or $70 a year, and that helps us with partnership take the gospel around the world. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in again this week. The word repentance means to change your mind. The message of John the Baptist and of Jesus was to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is accessed by a change in our thinking. If you are in outer darkness, there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That reality is not always out in the distant future. It is in people's lives right now. One simple mind shift can move you out of darkness and weeping and into light and rejoicing. God wants to wipe all tears from our eyes and replace our weeping with joy.